Hey, Cottondale Church family, this is Pastor Chad, and it's a privilege to uh, be with you again and and pray together in this online format. Um, um, we'll have to uh, still got to work through the details on on gathering in our smaller groups, and um, hopefully we can get that going here pretty soon. But for now, we're going to continue to have an online prayer meeting. Uh, at least for this week. And so, um, you know, a lot's been going on in our nation. Um, I've been concerned about it. I know that you have too. And, and, and it's a heartbreaking. And from a Christian perspective, we want to honor Christ. We want to honor his word. Um, and uh, we want to think, uh, try to think as clearly and deeply, uh, compassionately um, and biblically uh, as we can. And so um, I'm talking pr particularly about the, the racial issues um, that have arisen, with, especially with the uh, murder of George Floyd and, um, and other things that have happened recently. And uh, I came across a couple articles recently that I thought, I thought were helpful. I thought were, were good. Um, and I wanted to share them with you. Sometimes we don't might not take time to sit down and, and read through them on our own, but maybe together you'd be willing to sit down with me and just and read through this these articles with me. And I, I might stop and make some comment, but the biggest thing I want to do is is pray um, over them. And so hopefully we'll have time for both, but we'll just see how it goes. Uh, the first one uh, is an article that I saw written by a, a Christian hip-hop artist, uh, African-American brother. His name is Shy Lynn. And uh, after the uh, the murder of George Floyd, um, you know, uh, I think uh, he explains that somebody asked him, and he wasn't sure how to respond. And but eventually he responded. And the the reason I I thought this article was so helpful was because it helps it helps us. You know, as Christians, we know that the the murder of George Floyd was inexcusable, and we also know that rioting and looting. And, and violence associated with that destruction of property is inexcusable as well. Um, but it is important for us to acknowledge, uh, those of us who are part of the majority culture, it is important for us to acknowledge that the, that it, the black experience is different than the white experience. The, the, the experience of, of what it's like to live in America is, is, is different. And sometimes we don't think about that because we, we, we don't have to. And so, while the differences of experience do not excuse sin, it is it does aid in our understanding, and that's kind of that's what we want to be able to do, right? We want to be able to understand what's going on, and because we can't be, we can't even begin to to work towards a solution if we don't even understand the problem, and uh, and and the the feelings and the experience that are being felt by a large part of the um, of American society, and. And, 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 and also, we need to reflect on these things from a biblical perspective. And so what I want to do is I just want to read through this article together. I'm going to pull it up on my screen, and, um, and uh, hopefully it'll be big enough uh, as I'm recording it on your screen as well so that you can um, follow along with me. So I'm going to go ahead and pull that up and um, come over here. So... Let me make sure that that's big enough where you can see that. Okay, I think it's okay. Um, that's my little program there that I'm using. Okay, so here we go. It says, as a Christian hip-hop artist, I've had the privilege of proclaiming Christ in my music for many years now. One of the encouraging and surprising aspects of that journey has been seeing how the Lord has used music to make connections across ethnic lines. Before the recent pandemic, a Christian hip-hop concert was often a beautiful picture of the diversity of the new earth, with people from many walks of life united around the message of Christ and Him crucified. On many occasions, I've marveled at the reality of me, a black man from Philly, who grew up steeped in hip-hop culture, united with brothers and sisters of different ethnicities, ages, and cultures as we fixed our eyes on Jesus together. Over the years, I've heard from many people that they were affected by the truth contained in my music, even though hip-hop wasn't their natural cultural preference. Whenever I heard this, I was struck by the power and beauty of like-mindedness. 
it was clear to me that we were like-minded concerning particular emphases in the research. The glory of God, the supremacy of Christ, the centrality of the cross, and the importance of biblical theology. By God's grace, I will fight for all of those things until the Lord takes me home. But one of the painful things I've discovered over the last eight years or so since Trayvon Martin's killing is that it's possible to agree on those things and yet be in a completely different place when it comes to the issue of racial injustice. Just because I've made an intentional decision to focus on that which is of first importance doesn't mean there aren't other important things that need to be addressed in the church. It also doesn't mean that being a Christian has exempted me from the reality of being a black man in America and all the stigma that comes with it. In the aftermath of George Floyd's killing, my wife and I received an email from a white sister in Christ. I was hesitant to let her know how I was feeling for fear of being misunderstood and, frankly, because of emotional exhaustion. But as I began to write, I poured out my heart in a way I've never really articulated all at once. I've been encouraged by some around me to share this publicly. In doing so, I understand that I don't speak for all black people on this issue, though many can resonate with my experience. I also recognize the risk that comes with putting yourself out there and being vulnerable in the age of social media, online trolls, and keyboard vigilantes. But if this can help promote any empathy, understanding, and unity, In the body of Christ, it's more than worth it. Here is what I shared with her. Sister, I'm going to tell you how I'm doing. And as I tell you, please understand that I'm incapable of completing this message without weeping. There's a part of me that's saying, spare yourself the pain, Shy. It's not worth it. But I'm choosing not to listen to that part of me because I would be robbing you of an opportunity to bear one another's burdens and mourn with those who mourn, and I'm sure as a sister in Christ you want to do just that. Sister, I am heartbroken and devastated. I feel gutted. I haven't been able to focus on much at all since I saw the horrific video of George Floyd's murder. The image of that officer with hand in his pocket as he calmly and callously squeezed the life out of that man while he begged for his life is an image that will haunt me until the day I die. But it's not just the video of this one incident. For many black people, it's never about just one incident, just as it wasn't just about the videos of Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Philando Castile, Sandra Bland, Laquan McDonald, Walter Scott, Rodney King, etc., 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 etc. This is about how being a black man in America has shaped both the way I see myself and the way others have seen me my whole life. It's about being told to leave the sneaker store as a 12-year-old because I was taking too long to decide which sneakers I wanted to buy with my birthday money, and the white saleswoman assumed I was in the store to steal something. It's about being handcuffed and thrown into the back of a police car while walking down the street during college and then waiting for a white couple to come identify whether or not I was the one who committed a crime against them knowing that if they said I was the one, I would be immediately taken to jail, no questions asked. It's about walking down the street as a young man and beginning to notice that white people, women especially, would cross to the other side of the street to avoid walking past me, and me beginning to preemptively cross to the other side myself to save them the trouble of being afraid and to save me the humiliation of that silent transaction. It's about taking a road trip with my sons to visit Blair's family in Michigan, and my greatest fear being getting pulled over for no reason other than driving while black, told to get out of the car, cuffed, and sat down on the side of the road, utterly emasculated and humiliated with my young boys looking out the window, terrified, which is exactly what happened to a good friend of mine when he took his family on a road trip. It's about the exhaustion of constantly feeling I have to assert my humanity in front of some white people I'm meeting for the first time to let them know, hey, I'm not a threat. You don't need to be afraid. If you got to know me, I'm sure we have things in common. It's about me sometimes asking my wife to do things in certain customer service situations since I know she'll likely get treated better than I will. It's about borrowing a baby swing from a white friend in our mostly white suburb of D.C. and her telling me 
Sure, you can borrow it. I have to step out, but I'll leave it on the porch for you. Just go grab it. And then, feeling heart palpitations as my car approached her home, debating whether or not to get the swing and being terrified as I walked up the steps that someone would think I was stealing it and call the cops on me. It's about intentionally making sure the car seats are in the car, even if the kids aren't, so that when, not if, it happens all the time, I'm stopped by the police, they will perhaps notice the car seats and also the wedding band on one of my visible hands on the wheel, which I've been taught to keep there and not move until he tells me to, and even then, in an exaggeratedly slow manner, and will perhaps think to himself, this man is married with a family and small kids like me. Maybe he wants to get home safely to his family, just like I do. It's about having to explain to my four-year-old son at his mostly white Christian school that the kids who laughed at him for having brown skin were wrong, that God made him in his image, and that his skin is beautiful after he told me, Daddy, I don't want brown skin. I want white skin. It's about having what feels like genuine fellowship with my white brothers and sisters who share the same Reformed theology until I mention racism, injustice, or police brutality, at which point I'm looked at skeptically as if I embrace a social gospel or am some kind of liberal or social justice warrior. And it's sometimes feeling like uh, some of my white friends aren't that particularly interested in truly knowing me, at least not in any meaningful way that might actually challenge their preconceptions. Rather, it feels like they use me to feel better about themselves because I check off the black friend box. Much more could be mentioned. These were the first things that came to mind. So, when I watch a video like George Floyd's, it represents for me the fresh reopening of a deep wound and the reliving of layers of trauma that get exponentially compounded each time a well-meaning friend says, all lives matter. Of course they do, but in this country, black lives have been treated like they don't matter for centuries, and present inequities in criminal justice, income, housing, healthcare, education, etc., show that all lives don't actually matter like they should. So whenever someone asks how I'm doing with everything going on, this is some of what I bring to the table. And it's a big part of the picture of who Shylin is. But it's not the whole picture. Though I'm deeply grieved, I'm not without hope. Personally, I have little confidence in our government or policymakers to change the systemic factors that contributed to the George Floyd situation. But my hope isn't in the government. My hope is in the Lord. In a different context, the prophet Jeremiah said some things that resonate with me as I process this. Quote, I remember in my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. I love that the prophet doesn't minimize the pain or act like it isn't real. There are three whole chapters of bitterness and gall, and no trite cliches wrapped in theological terms. Jeremiah acknowledges how much it hurts, and as a result of his soul, is downcast. Too often when people are hurting, we can play the role of Job's friends, saying things that may be theologically true while adding to our suffering friend's pain. One of the most hurtful things we can do is make mourners justify their pain. Jeremiah gives thoughtful meditation to the trauma he has experienced at the hand of the Lord, but then he does something remarkable in the next verse. He preaches to himself, Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, The Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. Jeremiah makes a conscious decision to think about something that fuels his hope, God's character. He considers God's great love, God's compassion, and God's faithfulness. He reminds himself that the Lord is his portion. Jeremiah knows he and Israel deserve to be consumed because of their sin, but he also knows that the God who disciplines is the God who saves. So, brothers and sisters, in a nutshell, I'm so thankful for Jesus. I deserve to be consumed, but I'm not, because of God's compassion. That's what the cross and resurrection are all about. My pain and trauma are real, but my salvation, in a sense, 
is even more real. Because my pain and trauma are temporary, my salvation is eternal. This is why I choose to focus on what I do in my music. It's the glory of God, the supremacy of Jesus Christ, the centrality of the cross and biblical theology that put my experience as a black man in America into its proper perspective. I'm not giving into skepticism or pessimism, but I firmly believe that unless the systemic problems with policing and the criminal justice system are addressed, we're going to continue to see these kinds of things for years to come. My fear is that the attention garnered by the protests will eventually die down, as it always does, and then my white friends will go right back to life as usual. But I don't have that luxury. For me, life as usual means recognizing some people perceive me as a threat based solely on the color of my skin. For me, life as usual means preparing my sons for the coming time when they're no longer perceived as cute little boys, but teenage thugs. Long after George Floyd disappears from the headlines, I will still be a black man in America. And you know what? I thank God for that. He knew exactly what he was doing when he made me the way he did. Despite the real and exhausting challenges that come with my outward packaging, I know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. I wouldn't want to be anything other than what I am, a follower of Jesus Christ, who has been saved by grace and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, who also has brown skin and dreadlocks and does hip-hop. And God has chosen in his great mercy to leverage it all for his glory. Praise be to him. And so, I don't know about you, but when I read that, it it um it just it helped me. It, it helped me understand that it, there is a difference. Um, there is a difference between the black and the white experience in America and. That experience is a, is a large part of um, of uh, uh, I mean of the of the of the realities that we see and the frustration and the um, and the, uh, the the outrage of the black community that I do think it is difficult for white people to understand because our experience on, on a large part is different and so I say all this you know our experience. Uh, being sinned against does not justify sin in response, but it does it does help us to understand. I know I you've experienced it. I've experienced. It. I personally know people who sinned against others. I could even, if I wanted to, I could probably even say sinned against me. Uh, but then when I learned more about the person, learned about the past, learned about the experience and the things that helped shape them. It didn't excuse their sin, but it helps it helps me to helps me to understand, and we need we need to understand, and and um, we need to understand too the the lingering effects that that slavery and segregation and things how those things carry forward into the future to our present day. Now you know that those aren't the only things that contribute to the situation that we face today, but they are major parts. And so all this to say that. We need to work towards greater understanding, and and I hope um, I hope this has 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 helped to that end. And uh, beyond all of this white black, the reality is is that regardless of the color of our skin, if we are united in the in the forgiveness of our sins through Jesus Christ, then we are one uh, one body, one people, one church. You have one God and Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and in all and through all. We will be brothers and sisters with those who are in Christ, regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of how they look. We will be brothers and sisters together forever in a world free from sin one day. And even those of us who were the same color as us or the same race or ethnicity as us, but who did not know Christ, will be separated eternally from us um, under God's just punishment for sin. So regardless of the color of our skin, we are infinitely more united in Christ, regardless of how great the differences are otherwise. We are infinitely more united in Christ than we are if we're exactly the same culturally, you know, or in every other way, but are not, or but do not share in Christ. And so particularly, we should have compassion for um, our, our black brothers and sisters in Christ who do experience this every day and who are in... Um, and uh, who, who are navigating um, uh, difficulties and fears and anxieties of their own through it. 
And so let's just take a moment, and uh, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna lead us in a in a in a prayer through that, and 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 over that, and for that. And I just invite you to to um, lean into that prayer with me, and to extend our compassion, Lord, uh, uh, extend our compassion to the Lord, uh, expression of compassion to the Lord, and desire for His compassion to to help us to. Create a society where we're not afraid of each other. But I, I think Shaolin's right that I, apart from supernatural work, I'm, uh, I'm not sure what the government can do to do that. But we can ask God to help us. So uh, I'm just going to pray, and, I, uh, and you pray with me, and let's pray for God's help in this situation. Father, uh, Lord, we need you, God. We... We need you. Our heart breaks, Lord, when we consider, Lord, a brother in Christ who uh, is, for many reasons, uh, afraid, Lord, to go out, knowing that he will be perceived as a greater threat or, or have greater potential for threat or violence or criminality or whatever, Lord, just simply because of the color of his skin. And because of that, Lord, it, um, God, it was just... It's heartbreaking, Lord, and it's hard. It really is hard to imagine, God. So I pray that you would help us, God, to imagine it. Help us, God, to have compassion. Help us, Lord, to create a. Help us, Lord, to be the church, to love one another. Help us, Lord, to work intentionally. God, in our hearts and in our minds, to treat people with dignity and respect, regardless of the color of their skin, and to not be overcome by fear. Lord, because you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. And besides all this, Lord Jesus, you call us to take risks of love. If you can call a missionary to a place overseas where they hate Christians to proclaim Christ, surely you can you can call us uh, across the street to our neighbors where there may be some fear of, uh, of, um, of cultural differences uh, to, to, to love our neighbor, Lord. So... Help us, God. Help us, God, to love. Help us, God, to understand. Lord, help us, God, to um, and and to and help us, Lord, insofar as we can, that we don't have to experience these things. Help us to wield any influence that we have to help mitigate these things. But above all, Lord, we just we confess the difficulty of this situation, the brokenness of the human heart, the the reality, Lord, that sin begets sin. Lord, and and that, um, uh, and that where lawlessness is increased, the love of many will grow cold. And we, we just ask for help. And I just pray that you would give us as your people faith, faith, God, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And what and whatever changes, Lord, that can be uh, enacted, God, to uh, the criminal system and things like that. And, and above all, just it, whatever can be done to build trust, God, between our communities, Lord, so that we just stop fearing, Lord, and stop start loving. I pray that you would open such doors and open such opportunities, Lord, and work it, God. Above, yeah. above all, Lord, we know that how we treat one another is ultimately a, a heart issue. Lord, that and our hearts can only be changed by the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I pray that your gospel will speak forward. I pray that all of us would see how greatly we have sinned against you, Father, and yet how greatly you have extended your mercy and forgiveness and, 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 uh, uh, and love to us in Jesus Christ. And I pray that that would melt our hearts, Lord, and as we consider how great sinners that we are, Toward you, Lord, I pray that that would cause us, Lord, to be so much more merciful to um, to others, God, around us, and so much more willing to extend compassion and trust and faith and to and to give the benefit of doubt, God, and to 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 others, as God, especially within your church, Lord, especially within your church, Lord. We are united, whether we realize it or not. We are united. In you, Lord Jesus, we are one church, one faith, one Lord, have one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So God, help us live that. Help us be it. Help 
the church to be the taste of heaven that we're supposed to be, Lord. Because if the church is divided, just like the world, what are we? We're not. What are we telling? We're telling them that Christ makes no difference, and that's blasphemy. So God, help us. God, help us, Lord, to love you. Help us, God, to love uh, one another. Uh, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, um, it seems like that's most of our time for this evening. So maybe I'll read the other one, the other article, another time. It, it's 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 helpful it, um, as well. But perhaps this is this is more than enough for us to, us to think about. Um, if you're interested, that article can be found at um, thegospelcoalition.org. And then the title of the article is called George Floyd and Me. It's written by Shai Lin. But, um, but again, it's um, uh, my desire is that this will just this will help us. This will help us to understand and help us to love and to help us show compassion and to help us recognize the complexity of um, of these things and. And to look to Christ, really, who, who's the only one who can, who can solve this. Um, we know that, that one day when Christ returns, perfect justice will be meted out. And regardless of the color of our skin, because God's the one who gave us the color of our skin, God's no respecter of persons, regardless of whatever we have faced, each of us will be judged and receive what is due for what we have done in the body. And on that day, I won't be able to point over there or point over there and say, well, I was, I didn't love because, you know, this happened and this happened and they did that and they did that. that that's not going to fly when I stand before Christ. I won't be able to point fingers. All I'll be able to do before Christ, all that he's going to ask me is, what did I do to love my neighbor with the life that he gave me? What did I do? to treasure Christ and to proclaim him with the life that he gave me. And, and, I'll, and there'll be no, I'll, I'll have no excuses. I won't be able to point the finger at someone else. I'll have to give an account for what I did, how I responded, how I love my neighbor. And so I don't know about you, but when that day happens, I want to have clean hands and a pure heart before the Lord. And there's lots going on. And I personally have been just convicted that, um, you know, there's there's riots and protests and things like that, and um, but you know, I, I, I'm sure people have different opinions. But for me, I feel like the most effective thing I can do is love my neighbor right here in Dodge County. I, I could I could talk about it on social media. I could make social media posts. I could comment all day and express my outrage at this or that. But I feel like the thing that will actually make a difference is putting some skin in the game. And actually loving the people that are right in front of me instead of just talking about it. And so that's, 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 I feel like the Lord's challenge for me and maybe the Lord's challenge for you too. God, help me love my neighbor right here. Help me show compassion right here. Help me meet needs right here. Help me show that, um, uh, help me show that I love, that I, I love my neighbor. Even those, you know, uh, of a different race or ethnicity than me. Help me show that right here, right now, today. And so may God help us do that, church, and, and just continue to pray, Lord, that we need, we need God's help, and he's the only solution. Let's keep the mind of Christ, church. The world, it's very tempting because the world is viewing this from a worldly perspective that doesn't have God in the equation. And it's tempting that the more media we consume, we're starting to view things from the world's perspective and not God's. Believe me, the world, the perspective being looked at, the approaching things is not God's perspective. We're the church. We belong to Jesus Christ. America is not going to last. Frankly, it's on its way down. But the kingdom of Christ will remain forever. We want to look at these things through God's eyes. And so that that's 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 another challenge. Let's fill our mind with God's word, at least, and in, in with prayer, at least as much as we fill it with anything else on the screen. And I believe in, as we do that, God will give us the mind of Christ, and he'll help us to see clearly in these, uh, 
these are very confusing days. So um, I, ho I hope this has been helpful uh, to some degree. And, um, and that there's a lot more that could be said, but this is a, at least one thing that needs to be, uh, that needs to be said. And, um, and, and may God help us, church. Um, I love you. Uh, if there's anything you need, please let us know. Um, if you know of anyone uh, that is, uh, that's in need of prayer, um, we, um, you can always post that in our Facebook group. That's kind of what that's there for. Uh, of course, you can always let us know at church, and we'll we'll um, we'll get them on the prayer list. Uh, we are meeting in person again. Uh, we're meeting, you know, you can only sit every other pew. If you're at risk, we highly recommend masks. If you're at risk, you know, we we definitely recommend you wear one. We'll continue to live stream, of course. So if you don't feel comfortable coming yet, you can still live stream our service. Um, our service is at nine thirty a.m. on Sundays. Uh, we've kind of just kept that time from the drive-ins and. Uh, I personally like it, but um, when we're able to gather together, we can, um, you know, just we'll, we'll just have to decide at some point in the future what things will look like going forward. But we're just keeping the 930 time for now. And so, Lord willing, I'll see you 930 on Sunday morning or here or, or online. If there's any way that um, we can pray for you, uh, please let us know. If there's anything you need, please let us know. I love you, church. Hope you have a great week. God bless you.